Glad to see you all here today. I am Jeff Cox. I'm the finance editor for CNBC.com. Um, I cover a whole variety of issues uh, for our website. I cover the Fed. I go down to Washington and cover the uh, monthly jobs report. I write about markets. I do a whole lot of everything. Um, today, it's going to be a little bit of a unique experience for me. It gets me down a little bit more into the weeds of uh, portfolio construction, and we're going to talk about volatility today. We've got a really great panel, um, some folks who have, each of them has sort of a different approach to volatility. Uh, one buys, one sells, the other one uses volatility as a, you know, with, with, within the portfolio as a way to uh, construct different strategies. Um, it's a uh, great time, so I'm um, looking forward to everybody, uh, to looking forward to a lively discussion today. Our, our panel is here, and again, I'm so uh, happy that you are all here. I am a SALT veteran. I have been here for, I think, this is my sixth SALT conference. I was not here, um, I, I guess we didn't have one last year, I, when I hadn't been here for the one before that, but um, I've been here for a while. I love the whole concept of the Nuveen stage because I think it gives us an opportunity to get away from some of like those big sort of 30,000 foot discussions that uh, happen over on the main ballroom and it gets us kind of down into the nitty gritty of portfolio management and the nitty gritty of some of the issues that professionals like you in the business have to deal with every day. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our, our distinguished panel here. Um, I have with you David Dredge. He's the Chief Investment Officer at Convex Strategies. We have Will Bartlett, who is the CEO of Parallax Volatility Advisors. Uh, Nan Nancy Davis is here. She's the managing partner and CIO of Quadratic Capital Management. And Derek Devins, who's the managing director and senior portfolio manager at Newberger Berman. So folks, um, as I told the audience earlier, um, you all sort of have your own approach to, uh, to, to, to how to use volatility within the portfolio. Uh, really interested in getting into some of those uh, some, some of those detailed ways and, and how you do it. Um, if you don't mind, what I'd love to do though is start off with a little bit bigger of a view. Um, we all woke up this morning and again we saw the uh, equity market take another shot. Um, it's nervousness again over the whole ch China trade situation. Um, not looking for you to you know, become political analysts or anything like that. But what I'd like to know, though, is how these exogenous, these kind of, uh, these, these headline risk events play into what, what you do and how, how you, and you know, do they impact your thinking and how do they impact your thinking? So why don't you start, Dave? Um, hi, guys, I'm Dave Dredge. They don't impact my thinking. Uh, we're focused on, I, I'm a, a long volatility guy. My investors use me as a long cycle through the cycle tool to improve the convexity in their portfolios as a, as a superior risk mitigating strategy. We're focused on risk, but the risk we focus on is endogenous risk, is the risk that's built in the system, pockets of risk where imbalances and excess leverage might exist. You can think about that looking backwards is something like subprime CDOs and stuff like that. And so the exogenous shocks come and go. What, uh, you know, I say all the time, you know, uh, uh, a view is what you think is going to happen. Risk is what hurts if it happens. And, and so you don't know what's going to start the fire. What you do know is how much buildup of dry brush there is in the forest. Mm -hmm. and, and so looking at exogenous events, uh, a lightning strike may be meaningless if it strikes a ground where there's no dry brush. A lightning strike can be very critical if it strikes the ground where there's a whole bunch of dry brush. And so in terms of the current thing, the ongoing strife around trade with China, is there a lot of dry brush in China is probably the more important question. And so it's very specific. It, yeah. If, and if, if there's a headline risk out there that specifically impacts something that you're could, doing, then it becomes important. Could a, could a spark start a fire in China? Mm -hmm. I think that's worth worrying about because the credit creation in China post-crisis is unprecedented in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what about your relative value kind of guy? Um, how, how, how does it impact your? So for us, uncertainty is what creates opportunity. So uh, there's nothing better than seeing on Sunday morning that Trump tweeted that 
we were going to have tariffs. I have no idea what the implications of that are or what the outcome is. Um, but what it does is it creates uncertainty and volume and speculation. And we're looking at everything from a relative value perspective. And as people are uncertain, scrambling for hedges or, or trying to speculate, whatever the case may be, take their opinions on it, uh, it creates widened spreads and, uh, and better trading opportunities. So we don't have a view on, on the outcomes, but um, we, we like this. <laughs> Uh, Nancy, um, you're, uh, you, you take a, you know, a little bit, you're, you're sort of the, uh, the, the standout from this group is that uh, you have a little different approach to, uh, to, to, to how, how, how you trade volatility and, and some of the tools that, that you use to, to trade volatility. How, 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 does, how does these things kind of affect your, uh, your thinking? Yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm Nancy Davis. I'm the founder and CIO of Quadratic Capital. Um, for us, we use the volatility market, specifically options, to construct our portfolios. We do it across multiple asset classes, and we break up the strategies by asset class to deliver a convexity beta, or the exposure to volatility and the exposure to optionality for our investors. And so we, we really love um, volatility and uncertainty. And the thing that's so crazy about today's environment is that I think the number of things, whether it's Brexit or China or, you know, Turkey or the Middle East, the number of, or the Fed or central bank monetary policy globally, the number of uncertainties out there is massive. And the cost of optionality right now is at generational lows, um, in some cases lifetime lows in the case of interest rate volatility or fixed income volatility. So to us, it's a tremendous opportunity of, you know, there are very few things in today's market that are considered value investments. You know, growth is very expensive, private markets are very expensive, equity and bond markets are very expensive. So for us, we think the real opportunity is diversifying. I think um, David, I know, agrees with me that owning volatility as an asset class and diversifying your portfolio, it's really the best value out there, in my opinion. So we, we think it's a great time for investing. Derek? Yeah, I mean, in short, I think it, right now we're just returning, returning, whether people want to believe it or not, to a more normal environment. I mean, over the years, when we've done our option strategies around the world, whether it's emerging markets or non-U.S. developed, you know, the, the, the U.S. markets have been the exception. And to the, the, my colleagues to the, I guess, my right, it, today or the last couple days or even when you look back into the end of last year, it's more of this resetting of expectations, right? It seems extreme to go from a 12 VIX to 14 and then it goes from 14 to 16 and 16 to 18. And you're starting to see, well, 18 to 20 or 16 to 20 doesn't seem as extreme for a reason, because that's how volatility and interest rates and uh, insurance markets work. So I would think the, the last couple of days is just, look, to, to Nancy's point about all the things going on in the world, you know, we've been living in a low vol regime. We ha it's not necessarily that this is some extreme move or some outlier move. It's more of a return to normal, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it, I guess that was, when I was first asked to moderate this panel, one of my first impressions was, what volatility? I mean, it's just it's been, it's been such a correlated world over the last decade. Um, central bank policy has obviously helped make that happen quite a bit. Um, now, we're this morning we're get, we're getting back to sort of the long-term average in terms of if if you're just looking at volatility solely as a as measured by the VIX, we broke 20 this morning. So, but that I think that that's one like misconception is that VIX is just one type of volatility. It's mm -hmm. like it's like saying the you know, DNA sequencing is just one, you know, the human genome. There are lots of different types of volatility, and I think that's really the thing to emphasize to investors in the room is that's just 30-day S&P vol, and that's all the skew. And there, there are volatilities across all asset classes, whether it's commodities, rates, equities, credit, multiple indices. So I think the problem is it's that people get really fixated on the VIX, and that's just one, it's like a, one tree out of the whole forest of opportunities. Well, and I don't think it's the best value right now. <laughs> well, and I mean, you can get into second and third wave thinking there too. I mean, you can play the vol of all and, and that kind of thing. I mean, how far do you guys like to go down that sort of volatility, uh, 
rabbit hole, or the, I'm, the, the, I'm sorry, the derivative rabbit hole to, to, to play volatility? Yeah, we're a pure vol fund. Our, our view is only on the, the value dynamic of volatility, and those really are the value quotients, the, the at the money uh, one month vol isn't important to us at all. It's, it's simply a, a benchmark against which term structures and vol of vol and skews and convexity costs all build up for where is their value? Where is their the most efficient cost relative to potential asymmetry in constructing a systematic long-term agnostic hedging strategy that somebody can attach to their portfolio, allowing them then to go out and take more of the risk they want. It's simply insurance and what we do, and it's exactly that. Those are the components that we're trading. We're, we're never trading one month S&P vol, and, and I will second what Nancy said. VIX is almost always the most expensive vol in the world, the way we look at it, because vols, like everything else, values driven by supply and demand. Mm -hmm. And VIX is the easiest vol in the world to buy, so an inordinate amount of global hedging demand concentrates in that, whereas the supply of vol across geographies and asset classes is massive and diverse, and the demand is not nearly as large as it is in the VIX. And so you have this dynamic, and Will can really go into this on equity markets in particular, about the idiosyncrasies of volatility in different markets. There's a lot to the world that's not VIX, and my entire portfolio is not VIX. Ditto. Yes, and, and a lot of our portfolio is VIX. Uh, not because, I agree wholeheartedly with David that um, there's so much cheaper vol than, than equity vol out there right now. Uh, I've spent the last five or six years thinking that vol in the equity market is cheap. It turns out it's just been really low. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's what a lot of people like to trade. Um, and so it's that that creates the opportunity for us. I, I agree that you know some of the things that you were showing me earlier today, global vol is at all-time lows across asset classes, and equity vol is just, it's okay. Um, it's been carrying reasonably well. I think 2018 was a normal year of volatility. Nothing, you know, the, the real extreme event was 2017, and that was just exceptionally historically low vol in the equity markets. Um, but to that point, we've gone further and further down that rabbit hole, um, looking for other places of, of cheap volatility, and the reality is there's a lot of it out there. Mm -hmm. Um, earlier this week, I was at the uh, Sone conference in New York, and Jeff Gunlack was uh, the keynote there, and um, his play, is, for the folks who are not familiar with the Sone conference, it's a, uh, a charity-driven event, and a lot of big names come, and they give their, their big investing plays. Um, Jeff chose to go with something that was a little bit more exotic. I mean, most of the folks come up there, and they just throw out a, you know one or two equity plays. Uh, Gunlack believes that um, interest rate vol is going to be where it's at for the next year, and he it did, his pitch was a straddle play, basically, on the TLT, which is, of course, the long bond fund, um, and it's, uh, it, it, it's a little exotic for, for a crowd like that, but I'm, just, I, I'm interested in getting your thoughts just about, you know, do you think that, I mean, it, it, the premise of his belief was that there's, there's going to be this kind of policy fluidity that, that's you know, coming out of the Fed and um, it's, it's going to drive big swings back and forth on interest rates. Uh, yes, no, you, you, you guys on board with a trade like that? Mm. Go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, yeah no, I 100% I agree uh, with uh, Jeffrey Gunlack on that statement that interest rate volatility is one of the best value and cheapest uh, volatilities and convexity plays in the world. And it, and it makes no sense if you think about all the monetary policy uncertainty, um, the fact that the market in uh, late 2018 was pricing in hikes, and then a couple words from central bankers has made the market change and now price in cuts, and interest rate volatility has been taken out back and beaten with a stick. I mean, it was low in the end of uh, 2018, and it is dirt cheap, in my opinion, right now. Um, vol and interest rates is incredibly cheap, and I completely agree that I think it's one of the most mispriced um, and cheapest and best uh, asset classes out there because you have fundamentals, which are unknown monetary policy, unknown fiscal policy, coupled at a time that you've had a massive rally in uh, fixed income securities across the board, 
and that has dampened volatility. And I think, I think the problem is, is that a lot of investors are running to options as a way to yield enhance their portfolios. So they're writing, uh, writing options to collect that volatility, to collect that time decay as this alternative risk premia craze takes on and people are extracting the difference between implied vol, which is the price that you get in the market, and realized vol, which is actually happening. And it's kind of like a snowball where it's rolling down the mountain because the more people sell implied vol, the more people have to delta hedge. And so the more, the tighter the band gets unrealized. And so it's just a self-fulfilling thing that keeps happening. And right now, I completely agree with uh, Mr. Gunlock's comments that interest rate volatility is dirt cheap um, and it's really mispriced. I'll, I'll just add on that uh, in, the, in the global sphere of interest rate volatility. US interest rate volatility is by far the most expensive. <laughs> It depends which type of interest rate volatility you're looking at. Like, I would agree um, that it some... It doesn't mean it's not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> it just means that that supply dynamic you're talking about in terms of yield enhanced selling of volatility is even larger in places that have greater financial repression than the U.S. So but the story whole, spreads. There's a whole other market. Um, what he was talking about was treasury volatility, which is a listed market. And that, just like VIX, just like the comments you were making earlier, everyone can access that market, and therefore it's priced more um, fully and more expensively than other markets that are only available to institutional investors in the OTC market. So I completely agree that there are lots of different types of volatility, but there's actually, and I know you're, you're based in Singapore, there's actually a huge supply of volatility out of Asia into a specific type of US um, interest rate vol, which is incredibly mispriced. And it's all from uh, Asian investors coming in and selling it in structured products. And that, I think you would agree, the structured products market is where you create some really unique opportunities for um, very, very attractive risk rewards. Um, go into my uh, sandbox a little bit here. Um, I, I'm, I'm a Fed reporter, so um, I spend um, probably more time than, than uh, most human beings should thinking about things like what we just, you know, where the effective federal funds rate is. Um, this whole experiment that the Fed's doing now is trying to use the interest on excess reserves to keep the funds rate within its, uh, it, it, its range. But, you know, one of the things that I've just, on the sidelines, just heard so many people talk about is a frustration with what's going on at the Fed um, that, uh, you know, in October we were a long way from neutral. In November we were just below neutral. In December the, the, the balance sheet was on autopilot. And then in March we were done with balance sheet reduction. And, you know, so it's just policy fluidity that's driving everybody crazy. Does that drive you guys crazy or does that give you opportunity? Is this, is this is just this sort of uncertain world, this crazy world that we're living in? Does that, does that present opportunity? How about Derek? What, what? Sure. Um, you know, like anything in volatility, it's, can, it's generally always an opportunity. I think when we think about the Fed in particular and some of the things we've looked at, the, the big fear for us is the, how political the Fed is becoming. So whether they're, you know, whether uh, Chairman Powell is broadcasting or trying to forecast what he's going to do or give, give the market some direction, it's really now we've entertained now what we're considering more the great experiment is how do they get the balance sheet down. You know, people start talking about doing or being proactive ahead of the next recession. You know, the perception, particularly in the U.S., and how politicized even the S&P volatility. So in the volatility space, our idea of that it's more the volatility they're trying to keep in bounds rather than just drive the S&P or keep assets inflated. If the focus turns to volatility, well, and I defer to other opinions, but that's where you get caught chasing your tail. So all this is going to promote more volatility. And the, the end, of, end game fear for us is that you end up with a less independent Fed. Like it, it, when you talk about the experiments of getting the balance sheet down so that they can reload the proverbial anti-recession gun, what do you do when you're starting with still f close to $4 trillion in assets on the balance sheet? People are already talking about rate cuts. You're trying to, you know, tweak things on the side. And then in the headlines or what have you, if Congress or the president starts to have a view that things aren't going the way they go, and then it becomes less independent, 
you, you don't put more control in markets and usually have less volatility, right? The big experiment, the, the academic experiment of raising the balance sheet, we all knew buying assets is going to make things go up. It has. And so the independence is really where we, we feel that, that that volatility in their policy or direction is, I don't want it to go that far. Has the roll-off of the balance sheet, has that impacted market function? Has it, has, has it played much of a role in terms of, of, of how things are trading out there? say what roll-off, it's $3.9 trillion. <laughs> like, uh, nothing's, you know, it, we're, still, uh, we're still stuck on the bottle. We're still drinking the milk. Like, the, the gasoline is still on the fire. It's, the Fed balance sheet is $3.9 trillion. There's, it's been a name only, and now it's not even that. And, yeah. and to, to, to play kind of devil's advocate there, we, we kind of maintain a little bit separate view of it's a, still a big number. So it's really hard. When you look at $4 trillion and you say, well, we're just going to take $10 billion, $20 billion here, nobody's ever done this before. So it's, it, from our perspective, it's kind of hard to see how that, those ripple effects or the leverage that's in the system. It's a very complex. So I don't disagree with Nancy at all that it's still a real big number, but that's why it gives us such pause is we didn't even make a dent and things seem to get a little <laughs> uncertain. So the idea, agree, it's not a big move, but there's even some behavioral biases where it's really hard to judge what $10 billion means when you're putting against a $4 billion balance, a $4 trillion, excuse me, dollar balance It's sheet. a little disturbing though, right? I mean, to, to, to make such a small move and to have it become such a issue within the markets. I mean, you're an equity guy, so I mean, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you feel about it? Uh, I mean, uh, Rates should arguably be higher. This is all experimental, what's going on right now, right? Unemployment's at effectively record lows, and we're talking about a rate cut at this point. Um, higher interest rates create more volatility in the equity market. So, you know, I was hopeful that the Fed would keep raising rates. Um, seems like that's not going to happen. Um, but it does create a lot of uncertainty, and, and generally higher rates would be better for us. So, so I mean, in this equation, I mean, who's, who's kind of the tail and who's the dog? I mean, is it the, you know, is it the, the, well, the It's all political, that, right? Well, I think <laughs> it's a question of good intentions mm -hmm. and kind of the second order derivative effects that have negative implications to longer term financial stability. And I think you know, the Fed has a dual mandate. Um, and the problem is, is that since the crisis, interest rates have been so low for so many years and investors have been seeking, you know, alternative ways to yield enhance. And the sad reality for us is they're actually coming into the volatility markets to harvest uh, that risk premium between implied and realized vol, which has created this unnatural uh, supply versus demand, like David was saying. There's more supply than there is demand, and that's really from central banks. So it's kind of this, you know, it's really good intentions that the Fed and other central banks are trying to do to, you know, stimulate growth, um, you know, protect wealth, to protect pensioners, like all good causes. But the side effects are that financial stability is actually really low right now because so many investors have gone into volatility markets. And I think that's one of the big problems is that vol is unnaturally low. And I don't think people talk about the Fed put. But the reality is, as many investors are selling volatility to enhance their portfolios and generate yield. So it's sort of a good intentions with, you know, not the best, uh, you know, financial engineering to accomplish that. Um, so maybe we could use some of the time that we have left here to just talk about product a little bit and, and, and some of the things that you're specifically using to, uh, to accomplish your, your strategies in terms of, you know, just trying to find effective hedges against, uh, against volatility. Um, the um, ETF industry exploding, um, con continuing to grow, continuing to see a whole lot of different products introduced there. Uh, Nancy, you have a new product coming out, right? Um, you guys want to just talk a little bit about some of the things that you're using to, to specifically to achieve your goals? David? We, we, we're, we're probably the most diverse on the, we, we look for value and volatility everywhere in the world. We have a book that's full of volatility and second order and third order volatility and convexity. Uh, we're very focused in Asia because of the structured product dynamic. Like I said, supply and demand anomalies are what create value, and nowhere is there supply like there is in Asia, including into the U.S. markets or into the European markets, where the principal components of supply come from Asian investors. 
in many cases. Uh, things that we're very active in and very interested in right now, uh, given where we are in terms of the value on pricing of convexity, we're very active in sort of the furthest end of the volatility sector and variant swaps and convexity swaps and so real second order things. Um, we're very active in, interestingly, and, and Will's heard me say this before, generally things I say I'm active in are the things, the next thing that's about to happen because it's gotten cheap, which means it's probably too much risk taking going on. So we've been very active in convexity and Chinese stocks <laughs> up until this week and uh, very active in uh, convexity in uh, a number of currency pairs, particularly Asian currency pairs, including China in convexity and variance. Uh, we're very active in the interest rate markets, whereas Nancy said, the guys who are now massive providers of volatility into the US market through structured product stuff, have, they've destroyed their local markets. Imagine the volumes in their local markets. They push vol so low that the markets hardly exist anymore, but that creates some very unique opportunities. If anybody wants a PhD course in volatility surface, go and look at the Japanese yen interest rate vol surface over the last 20 odd years and it's something special. Um, and so there's a breadth of opportunities out there and this, this search for yield and this sort of central bank driven drive to suppress volatility and incentivize uncapitalized selling of tail risk through yield seeking short volatility structures creates opportunities the world over right now. And it's a great opportunity for our investors who again use us as a hedge to construct very, very efficient hedges allowing them to continue to participate in, a, in what's an ongoing bull market in, in, in beta and equities and risk seeking otherwise. Any place in the world specifically that you really like right now? That I like from yeah. a volatility perspective? Well, like I said, the places we've been most active up until this week and when I left town, I, I told Will he should get my calendar because whenever I leave town stuff seems to happen. Uh, we've been particularly active around China stuff okay. because it was the cheapest, cheapest Again, when I say cheap, I'm talking about a uh, sort of third order convexity dimension. It's been by, by far the cheapest thing in the last couple of months. Great. Well, yeah, so from a relative value perspective, I agree wholeheartedly. There's a ton of opportunity in longer dated anything but S&P 500 vol, <laughs> um, which is what creates a lot of opportunity. Um, I think a lot of rel relative vol managers, including ourselves, are often long the world in, in short S&P in one form or another. Um, and then with the S&P 500, vol service in general, there actually is a persistent supply of volatility in the near term, which creates great opportunities in skew and term structure. So a lot of risk premium funds come in and continually sell sort of 30 to 45 day, slightly out of the money calls um, as a way to generate yield. Strategies work beautifully for the last eight to 10 years in this low grind higher that we've had. But the effect has been that on a relative value basis, near dated index uh, implied vol is very cheap relative in the S&P, relative to longer dated, and particularly relative to out of the money puts. Um, so unlike most markets, there actually is a, a good demand in the S&P for hedges. Uh, people like to buy 20 or 30% out of the money puts. So they can sleep at night. We don't have the persistence of structured products like you have in Asia. So there are a lot of really good relative value opportunities within the S&P vol surface, and then in these sort of general long the world short S&P um, opportunity. Oh, nice. So Nancy, this works out as a nice little commercial for you. <laughs> you've, got uh. a, you've got a product coming out and actually relates to what we just talked about somewhat with Mr. Gunlack's uh, trade. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I'm definitely not here to um, pitch a product or um, you know promote anything at all. But I do think the one thing I will say is that we really saw a need in financial markets to close the wealth gap and give access to markets that, you know, on your iPhone, you can trade um, S&P options, you can trade equities, you can trade listed vehicles. And we're really um, going down the path of trying to democratize financial markets and give all investors, whether they're institutional, whether they're endowments, whether they're, you know, my parents, access to markets that they previously haven't been able to access. And we really see, you know, ETFs have had a lot of bad press. And I don't think that's really fair because ETF is just a wrapper, right? It's, to me, a better technology 
instead of having a private commingled fund, um, this is a intraday liquidity transparent commingled fund, and it just happens to be listed to give investors added liquidity. Um, the problem is really that assets, what's our, what are in the ETFs, and whether you know whether I ran credit at Goldman um, on the prop side in 2000, uh, early 2000s, and when you had credit widen out before the crisis, this was around WorldCom and Enron, the market would just seize up. It would be one by one, what do you want to do? So it's not the ETF vehicle that's a problem, it's really the lack of liquidity that plagues all assets. And I definitely think that's the biggest risk for investors' portfolios, is you want to have something that's liquid, something that trades, something that diversifies your portfolio. So we see um, you know, active ETFs, which are not passive and replicating an index is a really great vehicle to give investors more choices and to give them access. And that's what we see um, the product that we're uh, going to be launching as an access vehicle. So, you know, people don't have to go and own, you know, VIX just because it's the only thing out there and they have more choices. Yeah, you know, I think when we, th I, the model I use is that, you know, in concert with the, the title of this panel, you know, hedging's complicated, and really when you look at option markets, and I think we had a nice um, spectrum up here today, is you either buy it like you buy it for your home or your car, and you say, look, I'm going to spend X amount of dollars, and this is where it's pretty cheap, you know, whether it's term life or whole life insurance, depending on your policy, your pre and you go out and you buy it, and you spend some, and however you fund it, it works. Then there's the other end of the spectrum where there's some great strategies that actually seek out convexity, the unanticipated or uncorrelated payoff, right? Is that emerging market vol versus S&P or vice versa? Those are really hard to find and sometimes you have to structure them correctly. I think Gunlock's idea of um, straddles is more the sense that there's probably very little opportunity cost. If he's wrong, it's not a big payoff, it's not a big loss. If he's right, it pays off massively. That asymmetry is, tends to be very expensive, which brings me to the third side of the, or the third part of these markets is, well, you got to pay for it some way. And there are a lot of good strategies as you look, not necessarily just at the S&P, even though I think, as Will said, low vol doesn't mean cheap. So while we look at a lot of vol sellers, it also matters that the desks are setting prices because they've had unlimited capital resources. So derivatives desk, if it literally, they borrow internally for next to nothing and can run a massive book of derivatives that offset each other and price it very competitively, then something happens, the pri they reset prices overnight, that's why VIX can go up to 21 or 20, whatever it is today, very quickly. So in those three tranches, what we try to do is solutions that kind of span the realm but work with clients to say, hey, what fits for you? If it's convexity, we quite candidly, we don't do any of the more complex convexity or vol of all or what trades were more in the, let's help you either pay for it efficiently or earn some yield on it and find a solution that's uncorrelated. So I think as you think about how you're gonna do it, it's you cannot just go out and trade in the asset that you wanna hedge anymore, right? This is like the liberation of institutional and high net worth and as Nancy said, across the spectrum, everybody deserves a chance to have access to these products. Mm -hmm. To date, a lot of them have just been buried in hedge funds and behind closed doors or in big banks and investment banking systematic solutions. And I think we would all agree, you know, we're, you know, we've been fighting this battle for, I raise my hand and say, nine years I've been trying to sell some of these. And it, trust me, it's not any easier to sell today than it was nine years ago. So I wouldn't say it's oversubscribed. It's just about thinking about it more creatively or putting the building blocks together. And I think it's benchmarking, if I can just oh. call out the problem. It's really, Absolutely. you know, volatility, um, convexity, uh, inflation factor risk, these things are not in models. They're not, they're not something that, you know, with, with the move to passive strategies, people are going after benchmarks. And when none of us are in a benchmark, there yeah, is no do benchmark. You ever, do you think about that in terms of, you know, when, when I get angry sometimes when I see my own peers, they'll write it, they'll, they'll compare performance to the S&P 500, they'll compare it to the, to, the, to, to the Barclays, you know, bond index or that kind of thing. Does that kind of stuff drive you as crazy as it drives me? 100%, yeah. and not, not to add anything, we're always on top of CBOE, CME. They gotta come out with more strategy benchmarks. CBOE just announced a, a non-US, a deal with MSCI, I think, on having some of the non-US indexes for the options. So 100%, the evolution, and there's a, 
Peter Drucker quote that we use is like, what is measured gets better. Like until you can actually say, you know, we have peer groups and it took till earlier this year or last year for Morningstar to even come out with a, an option writing. Forget just convexity and some of the others. So until institutions and investors can, can make those, particularly consultants, let's all be honest, the consultant money is very hard to get and a lot of that is because they don't know how to even compare us. We're all just in one bucket. <laughs> yes, I mean, certainly people comparing us to the S&P 500, I'm like, if you want S&P, just go buy a SPY. You don't need to pay us fees to get that exposure. Right. Um, so, I mean, we're really trying to get low correlated or negatively correlated returns to the S&P, and obviously, when the S&P's rallying massively, your returns look bad against it, but it's not a fair comparison. It's always, it is frustrating. Just in, in simple terms, I mean, your job is to capture upside when you can capture upside and limit downside when, when there's downside, right? I mean, so it's not you know, this sort of synthetic uh, you know, race to beat some kind of bogey out there. But ours is even more strange, right? Because I'm in the insurance business. Mm. So you, it's laughable when guys compare me with my, our competitors and say, well, he costs this much and you cost that much mm. without any discussion about how much you're insuring. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's crazy, but the money keeps coming in. Um, the it, it, the industry's doing well. About 3.2 trillion dollars worth of assets now. That that kind of keeps in performance is helping. That the industry's having a good year in terms of performance. What are some of the you know, just as as we wrap up here, some of the biggest challenges that 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 you feel that you you face going forward in this environment? I think being different is the biggest challenge that when you're doing something innovative, when you're thinking about markets in a different way, when you're truly diversifying someone's portfolio, it's different. And it's not fitting into a traditional 60-40 portfolio, 40% equities and bonds split. You're, it's hard, you know, it's hard, it's an education process. And I think derivatives generally have a pretty bad reputation and, and a lot of that is warranted. Like, you know, I think I would agree with Warren Buffett who called derivatives weapons of financial mass destruction. I think it was like really early in 2002. And I think options are clumped in with derivatives, but derivatives cover, you know, all the Delta One derivatives, which are futures, forward swaps, all these instruments that I, I consider them credit card leverage. You know, you're getting exposure to something and you're not paying for it. Whereas with options, especially, you know, people who are owning convexity, buying optionality, it's almost like a debit card where the, mo the most you can lose is a premium and you know your downside and you profit take when you make money. So I think the big challenge is just being different and not being, whether it's in a consultant or in, you know, a model that people, people aren't looking for you and they don't know and then they hear, ooh, derivatives and options are very unique and amazing. Um, when people talk volatility, they're talking options markets and I think it's really an education process that people <coughs> don't know how to differentiate and how to weed to through. You know, I think CTAs are a great example. A lot of people thought of managed futures as long volatility, and they have nothing to do, most of them, with volatility. They're trading linear futures. So it's, it's really kind of weeding through and getting, moving the institutional needle to embrace true diversity and a different portfolio construction. Uh, and I would agree and add that, it, like so many prior developments in asset classes and stuff, it's also an expectations thing. I mean, everybody expects stuff to happen overnight in derivatives. Derivatives, by definition, in people's first mind is big moves, short time, mm -hmm. right? So they all think, oh, you should be, you're making money. VIX has doubled. Are we making money? <laughs> and you're like, it's been three days. Yeah. So it's the idea that still even these strategies over t need time you know, again, I think Nancy's point on CTA is a great example. They all were expected to make money in the fourth quarter or the volatility of last year. And you look back through real problems, real recessions, all these strategies pay off in spades, but we're just living in a world where now that we have the attention, everybody's looking day over day, right? It's we got the attention and now they look and expect, oh, this is the month, right? This is the month we all get paid? And you're like, it's... It, it takes some development. That, that's the biggest challenge I see right now. I'll echo what Nancy said. It's just something different, right? People have come through this sort of generational, unique environment where the 60-40 portfolio was perfect. So once central banks, Alan Greenspan sort of implemented the central bank reaction function of cutting interest rates every time equity prices fell, that was the answer. 
And then you made it, once rates got sort of low, you made it better by levering the rate side and calling it risk parity. Absolutely. And it was even better. But eventually you get to zero, and that's no longer the answer. And so if you, and we speak to pension funds every day, and you look at their portfolios, they are more heavily invested in traditional risk mitigating strategies, predominantly fixed income, than they have ever been at the worst return and worst risk mitigating dynamics of that part of their portfolio. And so trying to convince them that a solution to their inevitable challenge is more explicit risk mitigation and more convexity in the risk they're taking and reducing the allocation to what I call dead capital is so hard because they're so trapped in a 30-year academia, central bank, investment, institutionalized practice that it's so difficult for them to get out of it. And yet they all know they have to. Right. Last word to you, Will. I would just say, echoing this, education and managing expectations. And um, there's huge career risk uh, in investing in a vol fund because it's not a long, short equity strategy. Um, and just because the person you're speaking to understands it, you have to understand that they have to turn around and go sell it to their end users and for us. And uh, it's a high bar. Mm -hmm. Folks, thanks so much for all your input here today. It was really a, a great discussion. I hope you all pre appreciate it. I'm so glad that you all came out here. Uh, feel free to, uh, you know, I guess lunch is coming up shortly, but uh, take advantage of all the panels today. We've got some great stuff later on today at uh, SALT. Nikki Haley is going to be here later on today. So um, enjoy, and uh, thank you again so much. Thank you.